we'll go into our Bible Leaders Panel, which is uh, Leadership in a Time of Crisis. And as you mentioned, Chief, I'm also honored to be joined by two uh, tribal leaders for this next segment. Uh, we're going to have a discussion about our shared and diverse experiences um, battling uh, this monster co called COVID-19. Although the COVID-19 crisis has taken a terrible toll on so many, we have seen amazing leadership. Give me two more. We have seen our medical providers. That are four more and first responders answer the call of duty. And we thank all our first responders, our warriors that are on the front line, from our public health professionals, our doctors, our nurses, our CHRs, our police officers, so many, even our tribal leaders for being on the front line. And we have found ways to, to hold on to hope as we prepare ourselves for the challenges uh, that may be ahead. Uh, I would like to invite each of our tribal leaders to take a few moments to introduce themselves and their tribe. Uh, let's uh, start with uh, Wendina uh, Lee Gatewood, chairwoman of the White Mountain Apache Tribe. And then right after, we will hear from Cyrus Ben, chief of the Mississippi Band of Choctaw. Chairwoman Gatewood. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining this uh, National Indian Health Board conference and uh, being part of this discussion today. I do represent uh, 17,000 plus White Mountain Apache people, and I'm very honored to be here. Thank you for the invitation, and uh, thank you to all of you for doing what you're doing to help combat uh, COVID-19. Uh, I'm talking to you from the campus of Northern Arizona University. I'm at the Native American Center and I just want to thank uh, Sharon Doctor for accommodating uh, my presence today in order to participate in this plenary session. And White Mountain Apache Tribe today, as of yesterday, we have um, 37 active cases and we have not let our guard down and we continue practicing our safety protocols. Very honored today that our Rainbow Treatment Center is receiving uh, two awards today for Heroes in Action Award and, and, and another. So I'm, I'm very, very pleased at the efforts of, of our uh, local department, Rainbow Treatment Center. So good morning, thank you. All right, Chief Ben. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't know I was prompted. Uh, thank you, President Nez, uh, Halito Chairman, uh, Chairwoman, excuse me, uh, and to the National Indian Health Board, we thank you so much uh, for this opportunity and this opportunity for me to speak on behalf of our experiences uh, here at Mississippi Choctaw. It's been uh, quite a challenge. Uh, likewise, with your your uh, your situation that's been faced, uh, you know, it, it's a uh, a different different tune but the same song and uh you know it, it comes i come from you from our tribe with uh with with joy in the fact that we we uh, have strength that we can all work together and be able to help each other in such crises in in a storm that we are facing uh but also it, through pain you know each and every one of us uh has gone through uh, much pain today um we here at Mississippi Choctaw sit with our data at 41 positive cases. Uh, the great, the great uh, uh, impact here has been the mortality rate that has affected us. Uh, if you look at it per 100,000 uh, people in population, we have the highest mortality rate amongst anyone else in the nation. And that I know that is not the little impact that it has with anyone else, but we've been greatly impacted. Very grateful that 
many steps have been taken. Uh, you know, ultimately it lies in the hands of the people. We're grateful that our people have taken the steps to help combat the virus and the transmission of this uh, unto, unto our people. Uh, although the, the battle is not over, uh, we, we are still facing the challenges and I look forward to not only working with my people, but us as Indian country working together and also combating to save our lives of, of all of our memberships. All right, we will uh, go into some questions and we'll have our leaders uh, answer those questions. Uh, you know, many tribes, um, as I mentioned, uh, jumped into the action mode at the onset of this um, pandemic. And they didn't wait. We didn't wait for the federal or even uh, public health orders or even relief funding. Uh, with an administration that was largely unprepared for a pandemic crisis, many tribes uh, learned from one another. Tribes moved forward working with the resources at hand to help protect and support their citizens. So let me uh, ask this question and I'll, I'll do a follow-up question to uh, Chairwoman uh, Gatewood. This question uh, was submitted and it states, please share with us how your tribe, we heard a lot of great stories of the White Mountain Apache tribe and their efforts. How your tribe worked to protect your citizens before the Congress made relief funding available. Chairwoman. At White Mountain Apache Tribe, you know, when COVID first hit, we immediately uh, began to go into planning phases and, and getting everything ready. And at that time, we immediately followed the guidance that CDC had available at that time. And on March 12, I declared uh, an emergency, state of emergency, so that we could free up resources, have the ability to ask for resources, and, and we were in that mode. And come March 16, our tribal council met and we adopted emergency measures. We had our employees work from home um, where possible, of course. And there are some that needed to do field work, but we were very conscientious of their social distancing measures and what they needed to do. And um, in April, the tribe issued a stay at home order meaning uh, you stay at home only in the event of something um, urgent, like going to a medical provider. You need to go do your grocery shopping errands, uh, getting your prescriptions, those types of things. We implemented um, those and we instituted a curfew. And a curfew was met with a challenge at the beginning, but over time we began to stress the importance of doing this now, getting our people ready and prepared and getting them uh, accustomed to the ch changes that would be coming, that that's what we implemented. And a lot of employees, uh, tribal members had unemployment issues. They began to wonder, how am I gonna pay for my house? How am I gonna pay for my bills? And what the tribe did at that time was do some relief efforts. Housing payments were, um, delayed by a month to allow you know what payroll that they did receive could go to getting their essentials their supplies and then um, waivers like uh, utility water bills um, were were waived so that the people again could use their financial resources to getting emergency uh, essentials that they needed at the time that was a big relief for the families and um, we 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 didn't wait. We knew, you know, uh, White Mountain Apache needed to go into that mode of, of setting up our people and doing what we needed to do. And that's what we did. And it started March 12 with the declaration. Uh, Chairwoman, uh, a follow up question. You know, I think all tribes have learned a lot from 
the start of the pandemic to today. Can you share with us some of the lessons learned uh, that uh, with the pandemic and also um, are there best practices that you would like to share with our tribal leaders? Erwin? Oh, sorry. Some of the lessons learned uh, from, from what we have encountered as far as dealing with uh, federal uh, folks is, you know, consult, consult with the tribes. Um, our needs are unique. Each tribe is unique and, and they, we need to be consulted. And it's our hope that the federal government would um, develop a systematic approach rather than after the fact approach. And, you know, we have to work with one another what one does does affect another, but in the end, uh, tribes are different. They're unique. And we need to be heard. And that way, as consultations are being done, we, you know, if that's established when something hits, we're, we're ready to go rather than, um, oh, yeah, we, we forgot about the tribes, which is what we were facing with CARES Act. We weren't included in that and we had to fight tooth and nail to to get that going. Well at White Mountain Apache, you know, um, it, it affected us uh, in a lot of ways. Our people are very social. Whenever something happens, we gather there to to mourn with the loved ones who have lost a loved one. We go to family reunions, we go to honor people and all that changed practically overnight. We told people you can't do that now. And it was, it was very difficult. And um, we learned also not to be complacent. We have to be prepared. And um, as you stated earlier, wearing a mask is being a warrior. I couldn't agree with you more on that. And in the beginning, we had some challenges of people not wanting to wear a mask that, that it, they felt they were uh, a weaker individual. And it took a lot of um, working to promote that you're not only, not only protecting yourself, but you're also protecting others. And in order for us to make it through this pandemic, we have to work together and we have to protect our elders. And uh, we focused on our elders because at White Mountain Apache, um, out of the population of 17,000 plus, 8,000 are 18 and under. Well, 200 uh, or so are about 80 and over. So if the pandemic were to hit our elderly, that's very, very detrimental to our elderly population who are 80 years old and older, and we have lost some. And that was some of the devastating effects. And you have to act with conviction. You have to move forward. You can't just be um, reacting to people that are upset with you for the decisions that you have made. It's almost like being, um, you know, in a family. Sometimes mom and dad make a decision that the kids don't like, but in the end, mom and dad know that this needs to happen in order for us to be safe. And, and that's exactly what happened at White Mountains. Yes, some were not agreeable to my declaring an emergency early on, but it needed to happen in order to start preparation efforts for a group of, of, of people that you are have the obligation to protect. And we've learned throughout all of this, hope and faith are so important along with prayer and that the teachings of our ancestors come back to us. And it's almost like a reminder of, uh, you know, there's no vaccine. We went to our Apache tea, wild tea, which is what the Navajos have with Navajo tea. It's a, it's a healing uh, herb. Those types of things we had to resort back to. And, and uh, we have learned that hope and faith are so important along with prayer and family time. Before people were off on their own schedule, the kids were always into their phones. Family time has become more central and more important 
during this time and we've learned that and it, it has given us a a lens of what we took for granted before and and we miss some of those things but we know that during this short time we're we're in defense mode that we have to do what we need to do to continue on in our goals and accomplishments that we have for our people but it is so important health related or not that the federal government communicate with the tribes on all matters that way you're not uh, stuck with surprises. You, you have things readily accessible and also self-reliance. That's so important. Um, you, you know how to depend on yourself to get through these tough times and to help others. That's what we've learned um, at White Mountain. Thank you, uh, Chairwoman Gatewood. Uh, same question to uh, Chief Ben, uh, how did the Mississippi Band of Choctaw work to protect uh, your citizens before the Congress made relief funding available? And also, I'll uh, include the follow-up question, which is uh, lessons learned and what are the best practices that you would like to share with other tribal leaders? Chief Ben. Well, I, I may sound repetitive of chairwoman, but on March 14th, I uh, gathered the leadership with our health team together on a weekend, uh, acknowledging what was brewing uh, mostly was westward from, from western the U.S. to the east. Uh, we see most of the hot spots occur in, in the international uh, flight zones. And, you know, as we seen the, the contagion moving our way, you know, we immediately declared a state of emergency here and started declaring uh, steps inside our health by starting our health incident command by uh, getting them prepared and getting the steps that need to be in place. Now, do, do understand all of us were in the same boat by not having the knowledge of exactly how COVID would, you know, affect us uh, and the exact way of how to identify many of the opportunities of exposures. Uh, all the, you know, it, in the steps that we took ourselves was utilizing our own tribal revenue funds. And, you know, and from a health standpoint, we're thankful that we have a health, op, uh, health operation that we utilize third-party billing. So we had the third-party billing uh, revenue that we were able to tap into in getting the equipment. But then again, the challenge was faced upon uh, by everyone is availability of PPEs. You know, we uh, have our being able to take advantage of the Stafford Act and declare a state of emergency and tap into our federal resources. But, you know, here we were receiving expired PPE, you know, and I know of many other tribes reported, you know, that you know, the abundance of PPEs that you uh, were able to receive were not even be able to be used. And, you know, then we started using the, our own tribal revenue funds of doing the homemade mask campaign. And, I, and that was another thing that I think helped get the people to accept the mask. You know, we live in an age where freedom uh, is, is, a, is a topic that we were blessed to have uh, be able to get our God-given rights. Uh, and then as leaders, we're put in a position where we're starting to put in executive orders, uh, such as curfews and limitations and shutting down uh, operations, you know, that we are getting ridiculed. But at the same token, we're taking these steps not to take away freedom, but to protect our people and to be able to, you know, to see on the horizon of protecting them what could happen. And, you know, we're very grateful the, that you know, we had also a Office of Public Information that we were able to utilize instead of having to contract out and having public relations effect, um, uh, uh, public relations uh, information being dispersed into the community. And much like a lot of us in, in other uh, tribal organizations in our lands is we're spread about geographically. And as Chairwoman stated, we are a social people and to to all of a sudden go from what all we know is our cultural and social practices of being together in the loss of a loved one, being able to come together and mourn and pray 
and cry together and to be able to have that healing. And, and that was something that we had to change and unfortunately go to only gravesite services. And, you know, even with the, the medical facilities locking down, not in making it where our loved ones are unable to have their family or friends be there at that time that they take their last breath. You know, that alone was pain brought upon the people, not being able to be by their bedsides, knowing the battle that they're facing. And then uh, on top of that, to lose their loved one. And then, you know, to, to only have a short visitation at a funeral home and take them straight to a graveside. You know, and that pain is, continu is continuing now. And, you know, but that's the practice that we have to take as leaders. And, you know, uh, us, uh, along with shutting down our governments. And then as we phased back in, we took, we brought in the um, safety barriers, installed the safety barriers in all of our operations, whether it was our government operation, our enterprise operations to our gaming and resort activity. You know, the impact there is, 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 is well known by every one of us where for ourselves, you know, we're looking at a gross impact of 125 million in revenue. And then in FY20, we were unable to receive 35 million of budgeted funds. And so, yes, we're grateful that those funds finally came in, but, you know, we're, we're, we were frugal in our operations and able to substantiate operations for our people in continuing, uh, you know, that it, it's, it, it's, in the past and ever more evident now, you know, the treaty and trust responsibilities of the federal government is, is at the top. You know, we, we've said it as leaders all along, uh, but now and ever, they need to step up and provide those responsibilities that they failed to do. Uh, but in, in learning what we have, you know, we're able to go, you know, into the communities. We, we're grateful that we have a public health department that was able to also during the time before federal funding came in was able to reach out into the communities whether if it's community health workers and connect to the community or it was using our elderly program to reach out we were going house to house and still feeding them until the exposure risk level was too high that we didn't want to expose our elders or anyone by going to door to door uh, but again we're very grateful that you know we've been able to take the steps we've learned a lot and, you know, I, I think it is great, as Chairwoman stated, that us as uh, tribal nations work together and see what are the positives. You know, what was your strength might be my weakness or my weakness might be your strength uh, that we can share dialogue to be able to help our people. All right, thank you, uh, Chief Ben. Uh, I wanna go a little bit more into the um, public education and social change. Uh, Chief Ben, you mentioned that uh, uh, indigenous people are social people. So, you know, as native people, we are by nature uh, social and our communities are close knit. And you can see that evident with the spread of COVID-19 in these tight knit communities. Uh, not being able to visit family and friends at show, social gatherings like fairs and powwows. You know, we, we here on Navajo, we love our fairs and parades. We didn't have that this year <laughs> uh, because of COVID-19. And it, it has been difficult for our people. Not being able to follow our traditional practices, our ceremonies, uh, church gatherings um, when relatives pass away has been particularly hard as well. As tribal leaders, we had to educate our citizens uh, on social distancing and issue public health orders and curfews to avoid super spreader events. You know, as was mentioned about the lessons learned uh, from the previous question, uh, we have now seen that much of the spread here on the Navajo Nation has is because of family gatherings. I, even though I think families are still wearing masks, doing the social distancing and whatnot, but you know, we as indigenous people, we love to eat with our family gatherings. 
And so when you're eating all together, you know, the first thing you're going to do is take off your mask, right? And if there is someone that is living off our nation, comes back in, that may not know that they have the virus, brings the virus back, it could be a, a spreader. And that's what we're learning now. And that's what we're um, uh, getting the message out or even just letting our folks know to be careful when they're coming in with their immediate families. But uh, the question is, uh, as tribal leaders, what public health measures uh, have you taken to protect your tribal citizens and communities from, a, from the spread of coronavirus? Uh, Chief Ben? Well, one thing that uh, you mentioned was our fairs, our gatherings, uh, our powwows, or whatever form of gatherings of the people. Uh, I mean, that's almost like family reunion, uh, tribal-wide. And we, we also uh, had cancellation of our spring festivals. Uh, then went into the summer, uh, usually in July is our fair and great celebration of the people coming together. Uh, not only that, to be able to play your cultural sport of stickball, you know, where you, you've got you know, any hundreds of people would come and gather uh, just to play the sport and to take that away, you know, that, you know, who would have thought in March, you know, we're thinking, okay, just like any other storm that brews upon us, you know, it, it's going to hit us. We'll be back in, back in motion in a few weeks and a few months. And who would know that we sit, we are sitting here in mid October, uh, still in the midst of this storm. And those steps were taken and the, the people we were able to adapt uh, by starting to do some virtual activity using social media. Uh, we, we went uh, a whole month of July hosting a virtual fair, um, playing back old games, uh, our princess pageant, uh, even uh, uh, Miss Indian World, uh, she, she was crowned for her, you know, to carry on another year of her term. And, and likewise, we were blessed that our ambassador, our princess would, would had accepted another another year to continue her uh, reign as well, and we one thing I would like to highlight is we went into the community. You know, many times the adults uh, they connect to it, they understand. Uh, but there, as, as was stated, many of our tribes, fifty percent of our population, are probably under the age of twenty one. And so we started utilizing even uh, messages not only through social media, but door to door flyers, uh, whether it was through our health department or just in general with our public information from the government sector. But we went, we have, we have even gone um, into the community through our campaign that we stated, we, we canceled our fair because we care. We care about our elders. We care about our culture. We care about our tradition. We care about our sports. Uh, and with that, we care and we want to protect them. And so we started putting even not, not only just your normal, what people would look at as a campaign type poster signs that go into yards, but we put characters out there that our, our cultural and language program had utilized in our schools. Uh, they were animals. If it was a raccoon or a fox or a deer or a beaver, you know, in sending out those messages and also incorporating our tribal language uh, that even the younger generation, because we all know how much an impact a young child can have on a whole family saying, mom, dad, grandma, grandpa, uh, look at this animal and, uh, and say, okay, this, this, this character of a pig in, in our language, Chocho you know, saying, hey, Chocho is telling us to do this. And to be able to get that family uh, together, practicing the safety measures is, is key. And again, we, we've utilized multiple measures of communication, I'm sure, as everyone else has, if it's a social media platform, signage, or even, again, like I stated, we, the latest was using the characters, and it has been a great impact. Uh, just to also share, uh, uh, two characters uh, walked away from where they were posted in the community. Uh, our social, uh, so our Office of Public Information posted on a tribal Facebook page, hey, um, two characters are missing, uh, please help us find them. And those two characters were returned. So, you know, and to me that shows uh, that it was effective, that people are communicating, uh, that we can come together. Uh, and, and let's face it, who knows what the new norm will be. Um, but the impact that it has on our people, uh, people want to come back, people want to return to our cultural practices and, and being able to be social again. 
And with that message being brought, it, 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 when you get the buy-in from the community is key. And But I, I would stop here and allow the chairwoman, I'm sure she, she has a great story to share as well. Thank you, Chief Ben. And I have to let you know that as you were talking, um, I have um, my iPad to the side here just for additional note reference and a message popped up and even more messages came from my tribal members and you have many compliments on your accent. And, and they were saying, please tell Chief Ben that we think he just sounds awesome with his accent. So um, they're paying attention. <laughs> But for White Mount Apache Tribe, um, we early on, we instituted a stay-at-home order to combat COVID-19. And that included a mandate to wear masks. And um, masks were not met very favorably. So uh, as chairwoman, I'm also public information officer at the tribe. And um, I sat and I thought, how, how can I help the people be okay with wearing masks. Um, I, I designed a mask that had our tribal seal on one side and a word on the other side that said, which is uh, protect yourself. And um, I honestly didn't think it would go over very well, but to date um, I have passed out over 11,000 masks to, to our tribal population and some members of other tribes who are married into the tribe and and they wear them whereas before they didn't want to wear a mask but it it had to do with uh, with a um i guess pride like I, i'm from this tribe and i'm going to wear this mask but it also sent a public health message because other people that saw the mask hey what does that mask say and without even knowing the tribal member is actually um, engaging in public health education by saying, oh, it says protect yourself. And this is our seal. And, and it gets them, you know, whether, without realizing it, they're, they're promoting uh, public health. And that's one of the things that, that I helped initiate along with the help of my staff. And, um, you know, we, we implemented that. And then we did the nightly curfew. And then in response to the numbers going up, we instituted 57 hour lockdowns. And the first one that came was during July 4th holiday. And July 4th holiday, everybody was looking forward to going to the neighboring town to go check out the fireworks, to go check out, you know, this and that. Parades were canceled, the big feasts were canceled. All of a sudden during the busiest holiday of the summer period, you're telling your people nobody's going anywhere some people were, were very upset, but the numbers were going up. So we had to do that. And then for our uh, tribe, we're known for outdoor recreation. We have numerous lakes and streams. We have mountains. We have ponderosa pine and aspen at higher elevations. And in the lower, we have saguaro cactuses. That's how unique our reservation is. And we had to close that to the public. And that really hurt us economically. And um, our world-renowned trophy elk hunt. We get hunters from all over the country and the world who come to hunt our Boone and Crockett uh, bull elk. We had to cancel that because these were incoming visitors, you know, to the reservation, and we didn't know who was uh, bringing what. The same with the reservation; we had to close it down to visitors, and um, that took a hit on our tourism but we needed to do that. The virus doesn't move, the people do. And that was something that we had to hone in on. And as a public information officer, I worked with two other extraordinary young ladies, Brenda Paxson and Leanne Mallow, bless their hearts. They just got put into the, the PIO role as trainees and they immediately went on the radio and started promoting why we needed to do these things. And uh, it was necessary uh, to do that. And it was very difficult uh, at some time because you had tribal members that were like, um, why are you restricting me? I need to go do this. But you had to talk to them in a way to make them see that 
um, underlying health conditions could be very detrimental. Do you live with grandma and grandpa? You know, a lot of our tribal nations were all used to multi-generational homes. Grandma, grandpa live with mom and dad, aunt and uncle, a cousin. They all live in, you know, one home. Well, if one of them gets the virus, then everyone else is at stake. Quarantine happens and, and you, you can't move. And it was very difficult to, to have them stay put. But I'm very, very thankful to our emergency operations center at White Mountain, along with CHR, uh, Division, Division of Health, Johns Hopkins, our Indian Health Service. All the entities came together and came up with a plan where anyone who was quarantined, hey, we'll run your errands for you. We'll come bring you the food. Um, you need prescription refills? We'll have someone go get it for you. We'll bring you cleaning supplies. Um, and that made them, you know, feel more at ease because they were being taken care of. And then they got uh, checks every day, meaning uh, someone coming to check on them. And those are the things that we needed to do to make sure that our people began to understand, hey, I need to stay put here because there's a virus in our home. And it was even more crucial to protect the, the elderly and um, the contact tracing team. I have to give my hats off to, to them and the first responders, you know, and the EOC, everybody who just became active, active partners to implement uh, safety measures. And then um, during the 57 hour lockdown, we had fines. If, you're, if you don't wear a mask, you get, you know, we, you get a fine. And during that time, we also um, had a, a stimulus incentive to our people. But in order to receive the stimulus, you had to abide by the protocols to, to the letter. And if you didn't, you, you forfeit your right to that. And that really sent a message to the people that um, during this economic crisis, I don't have a job, I really need this, so I better pay attention. And that reinforced it. So that was very, very um, helpful at that time and using uh, a lot of education. I was on the radio almost every day talking about why you need to do this. Think about this. It's very important to, to save lives. We don't have a cure for this virus. And I had to explain from the very beginning that across, you know, in Apache, across the great ocean, someone ate this that had this virus and that's what we're being told that is now going worldwide and that has never happened bef before in our lifetime but a hundred years ago to try to get some history into the into the the people and the elders and the elders were very important in the in the sense that they remembered when i was a young child i remember when sickness came we headed to the mountains and we, we, we left the sick people. So that was a matter of social distancing. And uh, we depended on the herbs, those types of things. So a lot of education, 57 hour lockdowns, stay at home orders, um, and partnering to bring food to the people during this time so that they stay put so the virus didn't move. And, and those were some of the things that, that we are still doing to date, pre taking precautionary measures, and we don't let our guard down. There are some that are challenging in the fact that they, they just don't wanna abide by the rules, but you, you have to get a little bit more strict with them and say, look, <laughs> you need to do this. And uh, there was a point in time where you know, we, we had our officers get COVID and uh, that was a little challenging and we couldn't get other out, other outside officers to come help because they needed to take care of their own um, home areas. So um, a lot of work, a lot of team effort and knowing that what you do is going to save a life and that's also wearing a mask. So thank you. Thank you, Chairwoman Gatewood. Uh, I was just thinking that uh, 
those that don't adhere to the public health orders, uh, I think is universal. So we do have some of those here on our nation as well. And it, it's always a challenge to try to encourage them to follow these uh, protocols. Now let, let's go into uh, the vaccine distribution, you know, whenever we're hopeful that there will be a, a vaccine for COVID-19 soon, but not rushed. Uh, the administration introduced uh, Operation Warp Speed, which is a privately private public partnership drug and biotechnology companies to fast tra track a COVID-19 vaccine to deliver 300 million doses to the American public by January 2021. Uh, as tribal leaders, we can all agree that tribes must be included in distribution plans and that the supply of vaccines we get must answer the full level of need we have. This is especially important given that the data demonstrates American Indian and Alaska natives are at greater risk from COVID-19. So the question is, uh, and I'll, I'll pose this to Chair uh, Chief Ben, uh, recently the, the CDC and IHS held a series, series of tribal consultations seeking input from tribal leaders on COVID-19 vaccination planning for Indian country. Can you share your, your tribe's input about working with states or the Indian Health Service on vaccine distribution and administration? I think the need for it is great for uh, a form of vaccination that will help our people. Uh, but at the same token, you don't want to rush into it because there, there lies the questions, you know, is this safe? What are the side effects? What is eff effectiveness? And then once a vaccine is provided to us, you know, the question is, do you have the infrastructure to be able to administer it? You know, is there special storage and handling requirements? And if so, where, are the, where will the funding come from? And so there's, there's a lot of dynamics to it, uh, but those are some of the questions that we have posed. And, and yes, we acknowledge the need for it, uh, but just like if we were building a, building a home, you know, we have a need for a home, but we wanna build it correctly. We don't wanna fast track it so much that we, we have issues that we have to deal with after it's completed. And so, you know, I think that's the situation we're in is we, we do acknowledge a, a dire need for a vaccination, but we wanna make sure that we protect our people and be able to execute and be efficient in being able to administer this out to our people. Along those same lines, um, we work with our local Indian health services and I, I agree with uh, Chief Ben, we have to be very careful. And uh, vac vaccines are very important, but with something that is so unknown as COVID-19 and what it has brought, you know, you, you don't wanna be very aggressive and do a, a fast, you know, mandate of, of telling your people you have to do this. Uh, we don't know the outcome of, of that fully at this point it's in trial mode and just now we're learning you know certain pharmaceutical companies have now placed a pause on on testing because they're getting results back that are not known and, and why why it's happening so we have to be very careful and when it comes to the health of our people um, you know we we have to tread ever so carefully and uh, we're all uh, at White Mountain, we, you know, we, we like to contribute to the health of our people. In fact, White Mountain Apache Tribe has a partnership with Johns Hopkins for over 40 years. And in the 80s, when a lot of the infant babies were dying from diarrhea, it was the late Chairman Lupe that asked uh, Dr. Santoshim and, and the the professionals of Johns Hopkins to come to Apache land to help bring uh, some relief. And um, it took, you know, some trials at that time, but it led to an oral rehydration solution that is now known as Pedialyte that White Mountain contributed to the, the worldwide um, health of, of that 
effect for anyone who experiences that. So as far as vaccines go, um, you know, flu vaccine, we want our people to have that. And, and we encourage that because it, you know, the, the testing have been solidified. It's FDA approved. Right now, we're, we're looking towards that um, solid finding that this vaccine is indeed okay. And with, with, the, with the knowledge that we, we need to be very, very careful. We can't just um, openly move forward and say, okay, let's do this because we don't know how our people are gonna react to such a, a, an unknown. And, and we didn't know about COVID-19 and what it would bring. We still don't. We're still finding out that it has after effects. We're still finding out that it's still affecting our, our people. So granted, you know, the, the manner of, of how we deal with that uh, requires a lot of uh, collaboration with, with health officials, with tribal knowledge, culture, how to best, best proceed and at this point in time right now, the, 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 who would have known that washing your hands for 20 seconds is key, plus wearing a mask, staying socially distant from another person. You know, all those are really simple, but it, it is so hard to, to implement for some people. And, and those are the key things that, that would help protect our people without getting that shot but then you, you can't control where others go and, and when they come to you. That's the scary part. So we need to tread carefully and I agree with uh, Chief Ben on that. Thank you, Chairwoman Gatewood. Uh, follow up question, you know, before there is a vaccine and before any of that gets distributed to uh, the U.S. population. There has to be trials, and you did mention too that, you know, we, ne we need to know how this vaccine will uh, affect indigenous peoples. So the follow-up question, and let me, let me just say too that we don't question today when we get our children vaccinated for measles, mumps, and rubella. I think it's just, you gotta get it when you're young uh, so that you know, you're safe in the future. This C19 vaccination could be another added vaccine, a vaccination for young people or people in general. But there are vaccine clinical trials underway uh, are you allowing or if not have made a decision on it, are you open to have your citizens participate in COVID-19 vaccine clinical trials? Chairwoman? Um. For COVID-19, our tribal council last week passed resolutions presented by Johns Hopkins University to allow um, convalescent plasma trial, antibody testing, vaccine trials, and continued surveillance. Granted, um, it is on a voluntary basis. We're, we are not going to you know, force our people to do, to do that. And that's where we depend on Johns Hopkins and the staff at Johns Hopkins to go uh, to the, the community and explain what they're doing because education is very important. And uh, you, you have to obtain the, the trust from the people. Uh, you don't want to ever have uh, what we call a helicopter approach where you know, someone from un somewhere else comes and lands, you know, does their thing and leaves and we never hear from them again. It, it's very important. And, and that's why um, educating the, the um, uh, employees, the, the families, the, the extended relatives on vac vaccines and following precautionary measures, um, alert systems, the way of life as we have lived it, 
Um, and again, um, how, how are our people going to respond to something that's so unknown? Uh, we, we, we need to very carefully um, approach that in a, in a responsible um, approach. And we, we are adaptable. We are, our Native people have always adapted to um, situations. We've always had to react, and we're now reacting again, and we've survived. And th this is where, um, you know, it, it's very important to educate our people. And yes, vaccines are important, and, and it's that, uh, I, I look at it myself as a mother, you know, when I took my kids to go get vaccines, um, I, I had to f it, educate myself. This is important for, for this reason. It's been FDA approved. Uh, the, the side effects are this, but my child will have a prolonged protection to this. Uh, that moment of pain of getting that shot, but the protection will last you know, either a lifetime or a certain number of years. And um, with, with the vaccine of COVID-19, um, it, it'll be on a voluntary basis. And with the news providing the fact that the outcome of, of some of the trials are questionable, so they're pausing them. Uh, we don't know if that will pause everything else, but right now we need to do a lot of, of educating of our people, educating ourselves and, and uh, learning more about COVID-19 uh, as we move forward and, and the effects that it'll have on our native population, especially the Apache people. But it's my duty to protect my people and to make sure that they are not um, it, treated in a way that would make them feel like they're, they're just test subjects because they're not. Each one is unique. Each one has ancestral lineage that is just very um, something to be proud of. So we, we absolutely have to be careful, but it is going to be voluntary. Okay, same uh, follow-up question, Chief, Chief Ben. Likewise, there's no official decision been made by us. Uh, we wanna make sure we do our diligence, uh, relying upon our medical experts to be able to provide us you know, some guidance that you know that it is safe uh, but at the same token you know as you stated our reluctancy you know most 100 percent of society uh there's never no hesitation to take their mmr uh vaccination as a uh, to as a parent to give the mmr vaccination to a child and so you have to think of it of protecting your people uh chair Mulman said it perfectly it's our duties we are leaders we have to look look uh, out for our people. And we also rely upon our health experts and professionals that we have on staff and also our IHS support. And, you know, we, we face that battle and, and I'm sure other tribal uh, people have just like we have here at Mississippi Choctaw, you know, diabetes is prevalent and we have had medications that have uh, been provided to our people to later find out that it done harm to them. Um, so, you, you know, the, it's urgency to help our people is there, but yes, decision-making will have to be very uh, diligent and also making sure that it would be helpful. And, you know, so that, that decision is still uh, has not been officially made, but on a voluntary basis, you know, we would not ever deny our people, you know, that opportunity for vaccination. Thank you, Chief Ben. Uh, in terms of uh, data gathering, data collection, um, in August, the uh, CDC reported that across 23 states, COVID-19 cases among American Indian and Alaska Natives were 3.5 times higher than for non-Hispanic whites. Uh, State-specific data also show vast inequities in COVID-19 deaths between uh, American Indians, Alaska Natives, and the general population. Unfortunately, we only have 23 states that can share American Indian, Alaska Natives data for these reports. Also because of misclassification and incomplete data, the existing reports likely underestimate American Indian, 
Alaska Natives, Infection and Death. The question, and I'll pose this to Chief Ben first, uh, is your tribe currently collecting its own COVID-19 data? Are you able to share public health data with and get public health data from your state? Can you share barriers you have encountered or solutions you have crafted in relation to data sharing? Well, we've been very blessed here at Mississippi Choctaw, not only from a health standpoint, but to have a tribal government to state government relationship. Uh, you know, just in my first year in term, we've been able to pass a tribal, tribal regalia bill, uh, you know, and also to even to a car tag, the specialty car tag bill. Uh, and most recently, you, you guys probably have seen on national news of the state flag being removed by legislature and uh, being appointed to a flag commission uh, by the governor myself, that we're grateful that here in Mississippi, uh, we have a great relationship. They recognize us as Indian country and, and, and they also seek out uh, local, rep even the local representation to seek out, you know, a relationship working with us as a tribe. And, and then moving forward to, to the pandemic, as we state here, uh, the governor's office reached out to me and asked, would we like, would we be like to be part of the uh, state task force? And so we were able to put our chief medical officer on the state COVID tax force, task force, I said tax, but also to have Dr. Dobbs, who has been appointed the head of COVID task force for the state, um, to have him right in the midst of COVID at its peak to come and visit here at, at, at our tribal headquarters. And not only that, to tribal, visit our tribal uh, medical facilities. Uh, we've had a great relationship even with the Department of Health. We share our data with them. Uh, we've also jointly have had uh, uh, area testings at our site. We had a three-day testing where we, we tested almost 1,200 people, uh, tribal, non-tribal alike. Uh, that was not only just your PCR testing, but also your serology antibody testing that we're able to provide. And we've been grateful. Uh, the only hurdle that we had was making sure that uh, we could share medical information uh, with them and sign the MOU and been grateful to continue to work with our uh, state officers and Department of Health in this uh, pandemic. As far as data sharing for White Mountain Apache Tribe, we, we do collect our own data and we, we work with our partners. We work with IHS, they, they report to us daily. We, we sit down and, and have uh, daily meetings on uh, the results of COVID and then our partners of Johns Hopkins, um, other entities, you know, the state, they notify us, uh, notify our emergency operations center daily on what the state numbers look like. Uh, is, is it widespread still throughout the state? And what can we do? But um, some of the challenges that we have had, uh, particularly in our area, is uh, probably I would have to say a, a lack of information, a lack of education. And um, what I mean by that is the, the neighboring towns. Um, because we are where we are um, on our reservation and we're taking care of our own numbers, um, our neighboring hospital that is non-IHS, um, whoever went there, if it was a tribal member that went there versus our local IHS, um, how could we find out that that um, person, you know, did they test positive for COVID-19 or not? Uh, we needed to know. And because it was a public health um, issue, it, it became a problem because um, the neighboring hospital was only uh, providing information, not daily, but, you know, whenever they felt like it, it seemed like, because the, the notices were coming as steadily as we were doing. So what White Mountain Apache did was um, we reached out to the to the hospital there and said, you know, it, it's very crucial that we find out if someone presents themselves to your hospital emergency room or wherever and, and they test positive for COVID, we need that information uh, because we need to, one, contact trace, two, locate those individuals that um, also may have 
uh, been in contact with that person. And in the beginning, it was a little bit of a challenge to get that uh, data sharing. But in the end, um, they started sharing the data, which then helped us to respond in a better manner. And then some of the some of the um, the county numbers and the state numbers uh, were differing uh, than what we had, so we had to contact them and make sure that it was an actual reflection of what our numbers were. But but we we began to work with um, other partners that we hadn't been partnering before and say. Could, could we share this because it will help you, it will help us, and we can, uh, you know, come together and do a lot in, in saving lives, helping people to get better, and just sending that reminder of we, we have to implement more uh, safety protocols so that our numbers don't go skyrocketing. And um, but the data sharing is, is very important. And in the beginning, it was difficult, but I'm happy to say that now, you know, it, it's pretty much um, a good resource that we are sharing with one another and in the interest of public health. Thank you, uh, Chairwoman. Uh, I, I just want to take this time to also say thank you to our partners as well on the Navajo Nation, our Navajo region our EPI team, uh, the Indian Health Services, the many 638 facilities here on Navajo, the Navajo Department of Health under Dr. Jill Jim, uh, our Health Command Operations Center, our UCG. I mean, this just shows uh, the complexity of uh, jurisdictions and organizations. And as we talk about data, you know, data sharing uh, is very important that we also highlight uh, the various partners that uh, uh, help us get through this pandemic. And, and for the uh, Unified Command Group, you know, we have all our federal partners come together on a periodic basis. That's Health and Human Services, FEMA, CDC, the BIE, the BIA, IH, many uh, of these federal agencies coming together so that we are all on the same page. And I just want to say a few special shout out to the partnership here on the Navajo Nation. And where, as we are closing up this panel, well, one last question, you know, as tribal leaders, we are confronted with so many pressing and important issues, even without a pandemic. Who would have known when we were elected into office that we would be governing through a pandemic. I know Vice President Myron Leiser has said that many times. And, and as I think about that, you know, many and, and all of you throughout Indian country are doing an outstanding job in leading your people. And those of us, those of you that are listening, that are supporting your leaders, uh, I continue to ask uh, that you continue to pray for our leadership all across the country, all our tribal leaders. There are some tough times that go with leadership, making these tough decisions. Uh, Chairwoman Gatewood, uh, can you describe one of the toughest days for you in the last six months in dealing with COVID-19 and how you overcame those challenges? Um, one that sets, sets out in my mind uh, is um, a lot of our people received um, help from one particular medicine man, and he done, he had, in, you know, helped hundreds of families, which then included thousands of people because of each family having a lot of relations, and um, it it was a a difficult blow to the community when we lost our our um, medicine man to COVID-19. He, he was the um, longest uh, serving, I wanna say, because his father was also uh, a medicine man. And um, it, it, was, it, was, it was tough because now you had hundreds of families that included thousands of people that 
felt an enormous loss because they had had help from this man and he passed from COVID-19. And um, I, I really felt like when he passed, um, a part of our culture and the prayers and all of his knowledge went with him. Granted, he, he has siblings and those that he has taught, but um, he influenced so many and he sang for so many young women that um, people were very, um, very shocked, like almost as if to say, what are we going to do now? You know, and um, it, 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 re it reflected on the fact that um, as time moves on, it is so important that we stay connected to who we are and uh, we stay connected to our culture what we've been what we've been taught and and how we share our knowledge with one another and i want to thank you president nez for for your team when, when white mountain was was needing information navajo was who we went to to learn you know the do's and don'ts what's working what's not and, and that sharing of information really helped us so when it came down for for the medicine man and, and his loss, that was very difficult. And we overcame it by, we still have our language. We still have the prayers. What he taught us, we honor his legacy by living up to what he taught us and doing it in a good way. And, and his siblings who were taught also have now taken on that role of, of helping others. And so we overcame that. Yes, we miss him, but we honor his legacy by um, abiding by the things that he taught us to respect our culture, to learn of our ways, to do our best to teach our children because they are the beneficiaries of, of what our ancestors taught the rest of us. And our ancestors wouldn't want us to just, okay, that's it. You don't have to learn any more about our culture. That's not what they were about. They were about uh, being resilient, being strong in the, in, the, in the eye of adversity. They stood up to it and their hearts were like sinew, but their prayers were just as strong. And, and that needs to continue to live on in order to remain the strong uh, Indian nations that we are. And um, another blow, I, I have to tell you, this was an elderly gentleman who was the oldest elder of the tribe he was a very good supporter and he always checked on me. He always wanted to know that, you know, chair, chairwoman, I'm checking on you because you're my chairwoman and I'm so proud of you. And our culture is matrilineal and you're a woman. And I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for my mom who gave birth to me. That's how he talked to me. And one day he, he called me and he was a fantastic horseshoe thrower. And, and he called me and, and he didn't sound sick at all. And he said, Chairwoman, I'm calling you from the hospital. The doctor says I have this virus. And with the limited time that I have, I want you to know that I'm so proud of you. But I also want you to tell the doctors to keep working hard at finding an answer for this virus and, and tell them thank you for the help that they've given me. I'm, I'm very humbled by that. I'm old and the doctor told me I don't have long. Hearing that on the other end of the line and me being a leader and, and having to give him some hope, and he's so much older than me, but I listened to him and I told him, you're a tough cowboy. You're in our prayers. We, we give it to our creator to look out for you, and, and we'll remember you in our prayers today, and, and I have faith, you know. And, and you, you do too. That's what you've taught me. And he said, yes. And then he, he quickly said, oh, the doctor's calling me. I have to go. And I was going to hang up, you know, after I, I told him, you know, may our creator bless you. And he said, oh, chairwoman, one more thing. And I said, yes. And then he said, I love you. And I said, I love you too. You'll be in my prayers. And I hung up the next morning. This was like at five in the even afternoon the next morning 6 a.m my phone dings i have a text message 
and it's from his granddaughter telling me that he had passed and he was our oldest um, elder. And just like that, matter of hours, he was gone. And, and he too was, a, as was our wisdom keeper who knew the ways of, of living in a wiki up, you know, long ago. And, and part of him left. So those are the challenges that we have. And it sends a message that we must continue to, to be who, who we were meant to be. We were brought here not to fail, but to succeed. And we have to remain strong and, and rely on the teachings that we have been given. And, and it'll carry us through. So thank you. Chief Ben? You know, in um, the darkest moment, uh, the first one was probably, you know, us as a leader, we, 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 we self-critique ourselves. We want to make sure that we're efficient. We're making sure that the, the job that we do is for the people. And, and, you know, success is, you know, what we want, not only for ourselves, but for our people. And that's who we work for. And in mid-April, um, I was exposed. Um, unfortunately, it, it was following a tribal council meeting. And to get that phone call that you're positive, you know, brings into question, did I fail the people? You know, and that at first, that was a, a tough blow. But at the same token, I think the Lord put it, put me in that position to, to show that, you know, that you can fight through, you know, did we lose a lot of people? And that's been the darkest, you know, in the month of May, we lost 30 people. Month of June, we lost 33. And I mean, that's a person per day each month. And every call, every message, you get notified, uh, loss of a loved one, loss of a friend, loss of a community member young and old alike. And, you know, we were blessed that the numbers have declined. Um, and then of course, here in this month, we, uh, we didn't, we, uh, we've had five, one of them being a former classmate of mine. And, and, you know, it hits home. And when that pain is in your community, that pain lies in our hearts as leaders as well. But in the midst of the storm, in the midst of a pandemic, in the pain and suffering that each and every one of us face, you know, the mental anguish, you know, when we, we as leaders uh, don't have that vaccine, we don't have that cure, but we have the strength and leadership uh, to uplift the people, to guide them. And, you know, that, that's what I'm very grateful for here at Mississippi Choctaw is the people, because it's their actions that are changing things. It's their actions that minimizing the transmission of this virus from one to another. You know, and the pain, you know, you see in some of those families because many times it's also innocent. You know, the grandson, the granddaughter, they love grandma, grandpa. You know, uh, the, you see our numbers that are not just isolated here to Mississippi Choctaw, but all others. You see the highest numbers from the age category 21 to 40. That's the most active, uh, age group that you see and also but they're the least likely to be affected and you know innocently going and giving that virus or presenting that uh, exposure you know to those that are at risk or elderly you know and you know you hear it in the communities you know they feel like oh my such and such you know exposed this person or that person and, and you can't imagine the, you know, the, the anguish that feels upon them that they, they may have, who knows where that exposure occurred. But, you know, as a people, you know, that to me, the, the, the loss, uh, you know, economically, we, we can survive. We're, we're going to overcome that. But when you lose those cultural components, you know, are they your artisans? Are they your leaders? Are you, they your spiritual leaders in the community? You know, you can't replace that. And so, you know, but in, in the midst of this, I want to be, I want to give appreciation to our partners at IHS uh, from the, our Nashville area, Dr. Beverly Cotton, who is also a Mississippi Choctaw member. You know, I thank you, I thank you through this call, you know, for you and your team coming to help us in a time of need. Uh, following IHS's critical response team that came and helped us, we also had the uh, VA Medical Center from Jackson, Mississippi, sent us a team to help. 
you know, through this, they help the, help us expand our testing, help us give guidance. And if it was on cl in the clinical aspect or just from the education aspect out into the community. And, you know, as, as Chairwoman stated, we're resilient. And, you know, this, the, the, the history speaks for itself. Each and every one of us as tribe have faced some kind of battle and tribulation, but yet alone, we've always stood tall. And I think through the pain and sufferings, that's what carries us. It's that spirit of our people, what runs in, through, in the blood of each and every person, each and every member, that we are strong, we will be strong, and we'll be here forever. You know, and uh, but I'm very grateful to the Indian Health Board for inviting me. Uh, thank you, President Ness. Thank you, Chairwoman Gatewood, uh, for the enlightenment and guidance that you're giving to your people, but not only to your people, you're an impact all Indian country. We thank you. Well, on that note, uh, we also want to acknowledge our past leaders our leaders who have got us to where we are today as strong and resilient tribal nations. And uh, we lost a former leader here on the Navajo Nation, Thomas at City, who helped build Navajo uh, Community College, which is now Dinette College, was uh, a state representative, a vice president of the Navajo Nation and president interim president for the Navajo Nation. And our thoughts and prayers go out to his family. And we acknowledge the leaders that have got us to this point. I would like to thank you all for sharing your experiences with uh, me and the audience today. Hearing about how tribes are meeting the challenge of this crisis is inspiring and encouraging. We are survivors. We are overcomers. We are resilient. We are innovative, and we are not in this alone. We have each other. Thank you for your leadership and for our Navajo citizens that are listening. Vice President National Indian Health Board the